Hello everybody, um, my name is Manuel Supaina Ballesteros. I'm here representing the CSCS, which is the Swiss Supercomputing Facility. Um, as you might have noticed, I'm not an English speaker, native, so I will try my best to be comprehensive. Um, the talk is about a project, well, it's a subtask of a task of a project I was working on. So the project itself is much more bigger than this, but I will explain the motivation. I will put you in the um, context to see where it is coming from. Then I'm going to explain some design challenges we faced. I think this is the most important part because I'm not trying to make this talk um, a technical talk. I'm going to skip all the technical details and I'm just going to go to the, the things we learned during the process. Then I'm going to give an overview of the implementation, how things work from a high level overview, feedback from people we have been talking to, and then what else we need to do in order to put this into a production environment. So as I said, um, the bigger scope of the project I was working on was basically how to develop technologies around infrastructure as code. So our potential users will be either a scientist or a sysadmin and then they have a bunch of scripts which will define an infrastructure. So the goal was um, I have my scripts, pipeline, whatever, I want just to push to a git repository and that will trigger a pipeline which eventually will test my code and give me a result. Eventually this pipeline will try to simulate and build an infrastructure similar as much as possible to what is running into production so then I don't need to wait for queues or anything. Our use case was all around SLARM or workload management and, and so part of the process was to simulate this in a containerized environment. Um, so the goal was to have, so the question was, how can we have slum clusters that can be spawned uh, on demand and these clusters be ephemeral? So the spawn app, the, 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 they are creating on, based on the needs of the users, they run what they need to run, they disappear, they release the resources back to the resource pool of the center, and then they will give me the results of my, my tests. We wanted to reuse technologies that we were familiar in the center. We, wouldn't, we didn't want to get too crazy because eventually this will move to another team, with the exception of Kubernetes. So CSCS is heavily investing on technologies around the HPC center in order to make it more affordable from the user's perspective. We try to reduce the boundaries of from the users dealing with HPC. So all the things we are working on is REST APIs, um, cloud technologies based on open source technologies, etc. Um, in order to have a successful SLARM cluster from the user's point of view, it's critical to provide SSH access because this is the way um, the user interact with the workload manager. And then, um, surprisingly, when we were talking to other colleagues about what we were doing, most of the attention was caught into the how to containerize SLAM rather than the whole pipeline for the CI CD itself. Even today, we are hosting, um, on November, we are doing a hackathon on Kubernetes. Um, I was surprised, I realized that uh, out of 15 teams, four of them were looking into containerized slum. So it was the most common topic out of everybody. And also this was an R&D project, so we just wanted to, the idea is to have a set of tools and do the plumbing all together. We didn't want to worry about security at that stage. This is a project I started short after joined CSCS. So we are talking about around September, October 2020. So what I'm trying to say is the technology, the technology landscape around Kubernetes is quite different today than how it was back then, two years ago. But this is related on that work. So from the design point of view, I'm going to take a bottom-top approach. So I'm going to start from containers, then we go to 
pods, and then we go to other services provided by Kubernetes. From the container's point of view, um, we play a lot with this. We think um, we had to do this right, at least from the um, mental schema point of view. We basically try to use, um, we play with different distros, all based on Fedora, because we basically use CrayOS, which is based on SUSE, Fedora as well. So we play with CentOS, Rocky, Red Hat. They are more pretty stable, and they give good results for what I needed. Eventually, we ended up building five images for containers for the different services that um, are managing your Slurm cluster. So, Manji, um, the Slurm daemon, the Slurm controller, the Slurm DVD, and the MariaDB as well for the accounting. As you can see, some of these images were in charge of more than one demo, more than one service. And this is a key um, point here, because when you go out there to the container community, most of them will talk to you about uh, what they call um, application containers. So application containers are basically a container that encapsulates one application, which is always the same and is always doing the same thing. But in our case, we wanted to expand that. We wanted to have a container from a very simple way. We just wanted to encapsulate from the resources point of view the software we wanted to run inside. And that was a big challenge for, for, for us before. The reason is if you want to run multiple stuff for your container, then you need to orchestrate all these um, demos. And obviously, the whole point of a container is to have to simplify everything to run the less as possible. So the next question is, how can we do this? I mean, we started using technology like Supervisor D, but we came out quickly that we needed something, we needed to rely on technology that already exists, that people rely on, like for example, System D. And again, we going back to the, with, I work a lot with, um, um, community of the software and trying with the technology and trying to deal with, and um, I got um, a lot of re uh, rejection around this idea. Um, another reason we want the system D is because we want to install software for that on the container image. You normally will build your your Docker image file and you want to run, install the same thing using the same repos you might use, you might use on a physical machine. Um, if you do system D, supervisor D, you have to inject your binaries and then you need to tell supervisor D how to spawn them, configure them, etc. If you do that through system D, you just install them through your jam, uh, DNF, uh, CPAR, whatever you use, and everything's gonna be um, configured for you. So it simplifies the the things a lot. So eventually I came down through that website you see there. So SystemD has very good documentation and they actually have a document where they explain if you are building your own container runtime, how to make it friendly with SystemD. That means you can make your container runtime so SystemD can spawn container or you can make your container runtime to run um, container images which run system the inside, which is the use case we were interested in. So I'm not going much into two details. If you go to that link, they explain very well, but that I can, I can explain here today how to make this running. Basically, um, as a summary, you just need to share a few paths from the system to the container so system D can, can have a global view of what this, uh, the host is doing. And then um, on the last line, you can see the extraction that you run on the container when it starts in order to start systemd. So running Slurm on containers technology is not easy in terms of uh, Slurm and Manja are very picky in terms of user permissions, uh, user um, file permissions, files, ownership. Um, we wanted to, in our case, we have to spawn volumes and share volumes across containers. And by default, uh, Kubernetes will just give root access 
open access to everything you share. You can change that today, but not at that time, when on, on 2020. So we, the reason we saw the way we solve this is just we, you have the options to run what is called init containers, which are containers that will start, will start before the main containers running your application starts, and then we'll prepare the environment for those containers. So we will mount on these init containers the same file system that the end containers will have, and then we will prepare the right ownership um, for Manji and Slurm to be happy. Okay, so that's from the container point of view. In terms of the pod, um, it's very simple for us. A pod is the equivalent of a compute node. Okay, so um, so for example, we have three types of pod. So pod for computing, pod, uh, pod for the controller, and pod for accounting. Okay, and you can see the the different images, the different containers that are involved on each. Um, of the pods. Then from the design point of view, sorry, from the services point of view, here there are two key things to think about. One thing is the internal communication between SNARM and then how do you expose the services to your end user. From internal communication, we just expose the port internally through a cluster IP um, service type and to the end user we use a node port, which is basically um, the tricky part here is, as I mentioned earlier, these containers are ephemeral and on demand. That means every time they start, they will generate a Kubernetes will assign them a random port in order to access the SSH. So, um, so that was the the thing to keep in mind. In terms of volume, from the Kubernetes perspective. Um, we expose the, LAM, the SLARM configuration as a config map and then we mount it as a volume. The magic key is shared across all the containers. Um, we use Ceph on this case to provision the volumes and the storage to the Kubernetes platform. Um, and then for internal communication between Manji and SLARM, they communicate through a socket, Unix socket files. So for that, we use what in Kubernetes terminology is called an MTD, which is a folder in the host that you mount on all the containers that they need to communicate. This is a high overview of how the system will look like. So the yellow boxes are pods, the white boxes are um, containers. And then the cylinders are just volumes. So the end goal will be, I'm a user, I need a SLARM cluster, um, and I need, to, I need to spawn it with X number of nodes, of compute nodes, one, two, three, four, five, 20, you name it. As long as your namespace has enough resources for you to run your cluster, then you should be fine. Um, you can do this as much as you want. You can have collaborators, you are working on the same code on different branches, and each one of you will have your own SLARM cluster to run your test. All of them can run concurrently. Again, as long as the, the infrastructure can provide you the resources you're asking. And you can scale this shrink and down on demand per test basis. So, okay, so implementation overview. So we use vanilla Kubernetes, vanilla SNARM, um, container SLARM component, that's fine, pods, logging, okay. And then for the orchestration of this, we use Ansible. Um, today you might use that there are other technologies better to do this, um, that's true. But at that time, we didn't want to introduce too many changes too, too many new technologies to, to, to the team. Most of us were comfortable with Ansible and we thought that it was pretty easy to, to do that this way. Um, then underneath is just a screenshot of how a cluster will look like with three compute nodes. So, um, so on the Ansible side, you, ha you have a set of input parameters where you have different ways to parameterize the look 
of how your cluster will look like. You can define the name of the pods, the name of the cluster, the type of volume you want to use based on the storage class, and how many compute nodes you want to use, um, um, the counting, etc. I will explain that this later. So the Ansible playbook was pretty simple. So these are the steps it's doing, nothing more than this. So you have your Ansible playbook, which is basically, it just used the Kubernetes CTL as a client to talk to the Kubernetes API. And on top of that, you have a set of templates, which are basically YAML files from Kubernetes, which will be instantiated based on the input parameters that the users are injecting to the pipeline. So we have uh, templates to configure the deployments, the PVCs, the services, um, which are instantiated, it's sent to the Kubernetes API, then the script waits to, to, to the cluster to be up and running because it needs to be aware of which port is going to use for the SSH, and it needs to configure the SSH. Um, configuring the SSH is because you can run SSH internally and also from the user point of view to connect to the cluster using the public keys, the private keys. And internally because we also wanted to be able to run MPI jobs outside Slurm if uh, needed. And by default, the most basic um, configuration is to use SSH to interact with, it, with each other in order to configure the, the MPI cluster before that. So these are the set of this is a subset of the input parameters of this um, uh, pipeline. So you can specify the name of the cluster, you can specify the context because you can have multiple Kubernetes clusters to talk to. So the, the, the machine running this pipeline needs to have the um, Kubernetes client, client already configured. So you tell the pipeline on which cluster you want to talk to. Uh, you need to specify the storage class name. If not, it will use the default one. The namespace, the, the, the cluster is going to be running. The number of compute nodes, this is just a number. You specify 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 20, 30. And then the pipeline will, based on the name you specify on the nodes, will um, generate a list of all the compute nodes and inject it into the slum um, conf file. Um, what else? Ah, okay. Then you have the SlamDB deploy is a boolean because you can have a dedicated accounting uh, pod for your cluster, or you can say, I don't want to have a new one. I just want to reduce one that already exists. So you can have multiple Slam cluster with a single accounting uh, pod um, collecting the data from all of them. And then at the end, you need to specify the image you want because we also were thinking in providing the user the option of them being able to provide their own um, image to run with in order because they want to run their own, they, they want to test their own programming environment or a specific set of libraries, libraries, etc. Um, okay, so this is just I don't know how good you can see the bottom one, but the top one is just an example of showing you how systemd will look like inside um, a container. So it works fine. You have your systemd, your journal, your dbus, very basic installation. It just runs. If you follow the right guidance from the systemd um, developers. And then the bottom one is just a hello world MPI job um, on a small cluster of three compute nodes just to prove that the MPI also can run and it's integrated with um, Slurm. You can also run MPI outside, outside Slurm because we enable the, again, SSH internal communication across the cluster. So feedback. So we presented this work to another team of users external to CSES. These were power users. They were sysadmins. And then um, they wanted to bring their infrastructure into CSES. And then we approached them and they would say, look, we have done this. I don't know if it's useful, but we can talk about this. Um, honestly, we didn't get very good feedback. The reason is 
most of the system administrations today um, are still very focused on they have a very a strong technical depth I would say they have invested heavily on such tools like Puppet, like Chef and they basically run on a machine they build an image on they log into a machine and they make changes in the machine running from a container's perspective is quite different because you should not change a living container because if that container restarts all the changes will disappear they are not consistent and this is a um, uh, mindset that people need to be aware of once they want to move into containers. So, okay, so future work. So, things that might be interested is image generation pipeline. So, obviously, um, the cluster that we have built, they are very simple, they were R&D, it's just for us to show that it's technically possible to do. But if you want to take this into production, you, always, you obviously want to show your users the same environment you run in production. So that means you have your pipelines to build images, what can you do in order to use the pipelines to also build container images. In our case, it's much more complicated because we run um, Cray Shasta hardware, Cray Shasta systems, which works quite differently to, to other types of machines. But anyway, but the challenge is there. Another question is, um, in Tenia CSCS, we have an open discussion where do we want immutable images or not? If we want immutable images, we'll, that means that we need to add the programming environment inside and that has a cost. From the file system perspective, they are very heavy. And yes, you save networking and your system will boot quickly because basically your image already lives on the machine. <coughs> but you will have to spend a lot of storage um, for different versioning of your old or whatever all your users want to run, different versions of libraries, uh, different software they want to install, um, etc. And this challenge is also is even bigger if you run these less machines because then that means you have to pull everything from a centralized storage. Mount point is also a challenge topic here. How, how are you going to use uh, high performance file systems here, knowing that you might have um, clients moving from one machine to another. How is it going to behave with the clients? Going to be friendly? Do we need to put the client inside the container? Do we just have to put it on the host and then mount it? Um, this is something we haven't done um, any work yet. Uh, parameterize the slam configuration. Yes, it can be possible, but you have to do everything through Kubernetes. Um, how can we, someone else can build their own file and then inject it. But if they inject it, it has to be a template because obviously there are parameters that you don't know until the container responds because, for example, based on the number of compute nodes, you have to dynamically generate the list of compute nodes that are going to be living there. Same thing for the slurm controller, um, etc. Security, if you want to move this into a pipeline, how are you going to do the exchange between secrets between the, the, the machines running the CI CD pipelines and the code of the users, um, etc. Affinity and anti affinity, how are you going to do it? For example, you, um, for example, in ETH, we can do things like we develop new routing protocol. So I want to make sure that my cluster runs, each pod, each compute pod runs on different machines. Um, how can I do that? Well, that's easy, but still it's something that we haven't developed. Uh, then right now all the interaction between the users and the cluster goes through the Kubernetes API. That's a very bad practice. So what can we do? Um, maybe we can in, um, introduce MetaLB, which is a load balancer with, a, with a, uh, a set of public IPs which will be chosen on demand and then from there the people will the user will be talking to the load balancer and not to the Kubernetes API. Helm charts how if it's worth it to change the Ansible script to Helm charts and then the most important part is 
uh, scalability and performance. So um, people running real workloads into this and then not just check the scalability of Kubernetes. This is something that has, has already been proven, but how Slam likes to live in such a constrained environment because, because now you have to think you are running Slam in a pod with a set of resources that are restrained from the Kubernetes perspective and obviously Slam is another resource, resource scheduler so you also have to restrict Slam and Slam must not think that it has more resources that Kubernetes is willing to give it otherwise it's going to start killing your processes if they try to allocate more memory that are required, etc. And I think that's it.